about this humidity. No change, sir. That barometer's been falling steadily all night long. I, I can't understand it. Can't be the barometer, sir. We've checked up on all the stations and they report the same conditions. Nothing's happened so far. It's, it's impossible. I never saw anything like it. Neither has anybody else. Has the Coast Guard been advised? Yes, sir. Have them broadcast another warning at once. Hurry, hurry. Attention all shipping. Attention all shipping. All shipping will remain in port. All boats at sea head for nearest shelter. Violent storms expected. United States Coast Guard speaking. Yes, Lord, please, papers. See that every ship in port is tied securely to the docks. Yes, sir. What about that swimmer, sir? Ridiculous. She'd have to cut out the swim. We'll have to have a terrific storm at any minute. We can't be bothered with some fool trying to break a record. Have the police clear the docks. Yes, sir. USS Macon, USS Macon, return to your base immediately. USS Macon, USS Macon. Rome, Italy. Barometer still falling. Fourth day of unceasing earthquakes as yet imperceptible except through instruments. Greenwich, England. Tremors continue. Public alarm. Word that the end of world is at hand, terrifying millions. Send any word of encouragement you can. The International Broadcasting Company at this time brings you definite confirmation of the fact that the entire western coast of the United States has been demolished and submerged. At this time, we have no way of knowing definitely the extent of damage to Europe because all means of communication have been destroyed. Even though this international disaster has wrought inconceivable havoc elsewhere, as yet we believe there is no cause for general alarm here. However, take immediate steps to control provisions. Evacuate all unstable buildings. Shut off all gas. Panic movements of population can end only in disaster. That's all now. Stand by. You are listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. The following podcast contains adult language, adult situations, and spoilers for the movies discussed occur often. You've been warned. Now, take it away, Dr. Rausch. They must be destroyed on sight. back it is episode 213 of they must be destroyed on sight and i'm your host lee misogyny is now law russell and i'm joined by my co-host daniel mass destruction on a miniature scale harper how you doing sir <laughs> nicely done nicely done i'm doing well i'm doing well yeah this this movie does have a bit of this smurf principle going on right you know there's like mm-hmm. one woman and her you know uh Tri-state area or whatever, yeah, we can, we can, uh, we can get to that. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some surprises in this movie. Uh, we're going to be talking about Deluge from 1933, which is arguably the first disaster movie. I I didn't do the deep dive to see what is considered the first disaster movie, but I mean it's it's pretty widely. I mean I've I've seen like I found this one online just from people sharing some of the model shots on Twitter mm-hmm. and went like I put it on the list immediately and then I kind of did a little bit of looking and it's kind of like it it is kind of called like yeah this is the first disaster movie, you know. Yeah. Certainly the first time that we saw like a city like New York City being destroyed on camera. And I think even the first time we saw like any big city being destroyed on camera. So um it's got that going for it, and it's got some yeah. stuff going for it as well. So, yeah. <laughs> um, when I when I was looking for it on uh, YouTube, it also they also uh, had a link to a um, Clark Gable film from 1936, which is very similar to this, and like the effects work, yeah. although on a on a you know on a not B movie scale <laughs> compared <laughs> to this one. But yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, we got no comments. What we've watched lately, uh, Daniel has nothing, but I'll mention uh, two things and. First one I saw, uh, a movie on Shudder the other day, Bore, from uh, 2017. There was this Australian horror movie that is very similar to this uh, from 1984 called Razorback, which is also by about like a gigantic fucking boar just like killing people in rural Australia or whatever. Uh, this is very much sort of the same principle, although they kind of they change it up so it's got more of a uh, Tremors feel to it. 
where you know they're more interested in the characters and 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 putting them in the situation and a lot of great actors in it a lot of great australian character actors you got john jarrett who's the uh main baddie in wolf creek he's sort of playing the uh, opposite version of the kind of dude he plays in in uh, Wolf Creek, where you know he's a psychopathic murderer. Here he's like the nicest fucking kind of like humanist dude you <laughs> could ha- hope for. He's got Bill Mosley from like all the Rob Zombie films is in this too. A uh, lot, lot of really good actors. Actually, the cast is too big in this though, and it does a really bad thing. It kills off all the interesting characters like halfway through. So it's like if uh, in Tremors, Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward were like killed like in the first 20 minutes of the film. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad idea. That's a bad, that's yeah. a bad move, yeah. Uh, good, there, there's some really good uh, practical effects, some really bad CGI. Uh, it's definitely not better than Razorback, though. I would <laughs> recommend Razorback if you want to see a giant boar go around and murder people, you know, if that's your thing. <laughs> or just uh, go to Australia. That would be another mm-hmm. one. Where everything will try to murder you, not just giant boars. You don't need a giant boar. You can just get like a, any spider or drop bear or whatever you know the other thing i'll mention is a hbo true crime series a recent one uh, i'll be gone in the dark this was the um based on the michelle uh, mackman mackman era uh book about the uh iran's killer the uh, golden state killer Ooh, she, interesting yeah yeah she 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 was you know she was the the wife of uh Pat Oswalt before she uh died of a accidental oh. uh o- overdose yeah. of uh yeah. prescription medicine yeah not bad i haven't read the book i've heard i've heard the book is like she's not an actual detective or anything like that like she was just interested in like covering she's these, cr- these crimes right yeah. yeah and so she had the podcast about it and all that stuff and this this uh series kind of plays more like a extension of her podcast sort of plays more like a um, tribute to her from, uh, uh, from Oswald. And that's fine. I like that. She's really likable, really interesting. Um, I kind of want to read the book now because I do, I do like the way she writes. Although it seems like in the book, she writes about herself more than she writes about the the crimes. (laughs) So like if, if, so if you're, if you're into like true crime stuff and you, you like a lot of the details and everything like that, this doesn't go that deep of a dive. It's much more about her life and that's interesting enough. Like I like that stuff. Although I I think maybe the, the, uh, the whole series gives her maybe a little bit more credit for the capture of the killer than is probably due her because there was just tons of people who were constantly trying to grab this guy, you know, like retired detectives and professional detectives still working and police officers still working and stuff. And she, you know, collaborated with a lot of them. And uh, I mean, to, to give her credit, she definitely kept it in, in sort of more of a public spotlight and, and got more attention to it. So she deserves credit there, but it's, it's fine. It, it's not like the best sort of like true crime documentary I've ever seen. I think it's a bit too long, like six episodes. It could have been three episodes, but you know, it's, it's all right. It's all right stuff. Um, glad they finally caught that, that fucker. Like he just got sentenced like the other day, didn't he? Or today maybe even it was, um, I think, um, oh, I haven't followed the news in the last couple of days. So, you know, yeah, yeah. but uh, no, that's, that's I'm actually interested in that even if even if it's not very good I'm kind of interested in that so I might check that out. How did you how did you uh, check that out? I checked it uh, well it's 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 on HBO I, I assume like their streaming thing or whatever right, right, but right. I just went to a Foot Locker for it because I don't oh, have okay. HBO or whatever but it was it was worth like I mean she's really likable and interesting and you can tell why Pat Oswalt fell in love with her like kind of thing like just really really smart woman and I mean you also see like. Every once in a while, you see footage of her like doing interviews and stuff about her work, and like her, her and Patton's daughter comes walking into the room or whatever, and she's super fucking cute. And there, there's some there's some like really heartbreaking stuff, but there's also some nice stuff like uh, a lot of uh, the surviving victims of the Golden State Killer, mm. uh, you know, kind of get a bit of closure from this. Like it kind of brought a lot of them together. So there was some really positive stuff. From this, I, I felt that that was pretty good. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right, so we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, we're gonna play a little bit of uh, music, some podcast promos, and we're gonna come back and talk about Deluge from 1933. Ah! Hello, and welcome to Hello, This Is the Doom Show. I am Richard, and I hate the burning. Shh. Who are you? Speak. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm Brad. She came in and said, bark, 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 <laughs> and he said, bark, 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 and she said, bark, 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 bark. that's what I got. One is the Suspiria boner. The other is the Inferno boner. <laughs> which, anyway. which one is crying? <laughs> the boner of tears. <laughs> Hello, this is the Doomed Show. Is available on Hello Doomed Show. Automatic. Com and Doomed Movie Thon. Com. Hello, hello, this is the Doom Show. Richard, Brad, Jeffrey, Napa. It's the Doom Show. Hello, hello, this is the Doom Show. Slashes, GI, low and horror. It's the Doom Show. Ah! Oh. Deluge from 1933, and uh, this is directed by Felix E. Feist, who uh, you might know from just a shit ton of stuff he's done, but uh, the kind of things that uh, stuck out uh, for me, this is one I haven't seen, but it sounds really interesting, The Devil Thumbs a Ride from 1947, Mm -hmm. which looks like noir goodness. Should put it on the list, yep, for sure. And the one I did know is Donovan's Brain from 1953, which was his mm. last uh, feature film. Uh, so, yeah, look, good-looking stuff here. Uh, written by uh, John F. Goodrich and Warren Duff, and it's uh, based on the novel by S. Fowler Wright. And I actually read a bit of it uh, the other day because it's it's uh, public domain, so you can... Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I was meaning to check that out. I just didn't get the chance, but cool. Mm. Uh, so this is starring um, Peggy Sh- Shannon as Claire Arlington, and I can't remember if it's her or the other one that uh, I think it's her had a really short life, like she only lived into her thirties. Uh, chronic she alcoholism died, died at thirty four in yeah. nineteen forty one. <laughs> she scarred her liver up, and which is a yeah. shame. It is. It is one of those things. It is one of those things of like you know died of alcoholism at thirty four, and you're just like, gee, how much. Like, mm. how bad does your alcoholism have to be? <laughs> like, that's rough. That's rough. I mean, was she drinking turpentine and stuff? Like, fuck, man. Like, well, um, I mean, if she was an alcoholic for, for long enough. I mean, she was pre prohibition. So, you know, who knows what, you know. Right. Right. Uh, Lois Wilson as Helen Webster. And she lived on to like the 80s. Like, she went to 90 something she died at, I think. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, and two extremes uh, on that one. Mm hmm. <laughs> Very long career, a lot of stuff. I nothing jumped out at me on that one. Sydney Blackmer is uh, Martin Webster. The one thing that jumped out here for me on, on his career, he also a very long career. Rosemary's Baby, one of one of the old Satanists in Rosemary's Baby, as far as I can uh, remember. <laughs> nice. So yeah, um, oh, and had a bit part in uh, Perils of Pauline. <laughs> oh, did he? Oh shit. Okay, yeah. I didn't. I didn't his, catch uh, that for his Wikipedia. I just caught that. Yeah. 
uh, Matt Moore as Tom, and he was in the original 1917 version of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, he mm-hmm. was in he was in the front page uh, that we've covered, and uh, another thing that stuck out: I Bury the Living, which is a nice little uh, sort of B horror movie. Fred Kohler, big time movie villain in the the early years of Hollywood, as Jepson, and he was in the Iron Horse from Twenty Four that we covered. Ralph uh, Harold as Norwood. Edward Von Sloan, as you may know as Van Helsing from Dracula and Dracula's Daughter. Mm-hmm. He was also in uh, Frankenstein and uh, The Mummy. Uh, so he was jumping all around Universal Horror stuff uh, around this time. And he had a pretty long and distinguished career. And Samuel S. Hines as Chief Forecaster. And we have a synopsis here from Ken Miller on IMDb. New York City awaits a massive series of tidal waves which has already struck the North American West Coast. As the waves strike and destroy the city, Martin is separated from his family. Seemingly the only survivor, he meets Claire, and they give one another aid and comfort during the crisis. Later, other survivors arise. As society attempts to rebuild, Martin and his wife Helen reunite. Claire, who has shared a great deal with Martin during their time alone, informs Helen that she will not live without Martin. And, uh, yeah, that's that's like the story in the back half of this kind of <laughs> kind of sure. thing. <laughs> yeah. But this is a really interesting one. Uh, I I was actually very surprised by some of the stuff that jumps out in this film uh, once you get past the uh, the initial kind of like money shot of uh, the destruction. But uh, it's, funny like, your... front load, it's funny how they front load all the effect shots, right? You know. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, well, what are your initial thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's kind of got a three-part structure in which, uh, you know, you kind of have this uh, opening, which is very kind of traditional disaster movie stuff. And uh, yeah. it's funny that, like, when I kind of saw this, like, oh, Deluge, and then it's got a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of really cool effect shots. I'm kind of like, okay, well, so uh, it's going to be a movie about the disaster, and so we're basically going to ramp up to the big, you know, money shots, and then at the end of the movie is like, and then New York is flooded and then the water recedes and then like oh we all survived or some of us died or whatever and that's the mm-hmm. movie because that's our kind of current conception of what a disaster movie is uh not so much here <laughs> all <laughs> this stuff happens in the first like you know <laughs> 15 minutes i mean this is only yeah. an hour and six minutes long um and so uh or like 70 minutes or whatever apparently bits of this might be missing um i mean there yeah. are kind of a couple of different run times you find if you kind of google around for this and um apparently like maybe some elements were, were lost in the, some of the translations but um there's a nice looking version on YouTube, which I think I think the the version that both of us watched. Um, the uh, uh, Kino Lorber uh, print yeah. of this, which is like what yeah. 106 minutes, or, or yeah. I mean, hour six minutes. Oh. Hour six minutes, yeah. So it's a quick watch, um, and it's definitely worth your time. I'll kind of leave it at that. But mm-hmm. no, this is really like the whole idea is like we're going to give you the big effect shots right at the beginning. We're going to flood New York City and imply that we're flooding most of the world. And then give you kind of a character drama afterwards. And so then yeah. we follow this woman, uh, Claire, Peggy Shannon, who is uh, very good here, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she runs into this uh, situation where she's essentially the, the play thing or sort of the, the thing that these two men are fighting over in this kind of post-apocalyptic wasteland. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in, the, in this kind of frontier environment. It's a little bit of a Western in that way, right? You know, we sort, mm-hmm. of, have a sort of like Western world because suddenly, you know, like, oh, civilization is gone. And so we're just going to, we're going to go hang out in a farmhouse and fight over a woman. That's the, that's, that's yeah. what we do. <laughs> um, and then she escapes from those guys and then ends mm-hmm. up in this kind of like character drama where she falls in love with this guy. And uh, then it turns out his wife survived. And then he has to then then they kind of have this like conflict between the two of them as to who's gonna be with who, and then uh, the movie ends basically. <laughs> so yeah. you know that's the uh, yeah kind of a kind of a weird movie. Um, from what I understand, I don't know. You read a bit of the book. Um, you know, the little bit that I read about it was that he was is that um Wright is considered kind of a conservative author, and that he was you know the whole point of the of the book was you know like uh hey this whole like modern society thing is kind of bullshit it was better when we lived more simple lives and i'm i'm wondering you know did you did you get any of that in the in what you read of the book was it a is little there, is there a, a little something different yeah. it it is it is very um anti like uh futurist anti technology kind yeah. of narrative like it's very much things are much better if People are in simpler circumstances. They get along much better if, if that's the case. That's sort of his general uh, crux of it. But 
unless I read the ending wrong, and I just scanned through it briefly, but he was cool with polyamory because the right. ending right. in the in the actual book is way different than the ending in this film. Yeah, no, I was I was kind of expecting the ending to kind of go in a different way of like, well, maybe mm-hmm. we're all just going to live together and it's just going to be fine. Um, this is a pre code movie after all, mm-hmm. and. You know, there's definitely some pre-code element to this. I mean, there's definitely it's oh, much the more... underwear she wears. That's even oh. that's pretty skimpy, for, even for 33. Like that's oh yeah, that's skimpy for 33. I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot in this that I felt like felt really kind of more like 1970s. I mean, not just mm-hmm. sort of the underwear, not the style of the underwear, but sort of like we get a nice shot of her in her underwear. Yeah, know? and it's not like the skimpiest underwear, but certainly like. It's not it's granny pretty, panties. It's, you get a, you get a nice shot of it too. Like is this is not like sort of like oh we're kind of looking away or whatever. This is this is kind of like oh look at the girl in the skimpy in the skimpy clothes. Um, but you also get uh, a lot of the effect shots can kind of would compare favorably to a lot of stuff from the seventies. A lot of those kind of disaster films from, mm-hmm. from the seventies and even early eighties. This stuff looks uh, really nice. You know. Yeah, these techniques they didn't evolve that much from this period. Like they're just you know they're they're filmed with better cameras maybe more mm-hmm. money behind them, but a lot of these techniques are exactly what they use straight up to like the seventies for the most part. So a lot of like, this is a B movie. So uh, it is very cheaply done. Uh, some of these effects, they don't hold up too well. Like I honestly, I'd say the, 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 sh- the shabbiest part of this is the composite shots where you have yeah. their, like the crowd, like uh, superimposed over like a uh, crumbling city or whatever the fuck that looks that just looks like dog shit. Like there, there's right. nothing you can do about it. But a lot of these special effects and just the the work put behind them, and like you, you can see if you search on Google and stuff, you can find like stills of them, you know, putting this together and people standing on the set and the the, the, the size of the actual city they used and everything. That stuff's really great. Like it, it looks fucking fantastic. Um, you, you have to sort of suspend your disbelief and get into it a bit because it is wonky like this is if Jenga was adapted into a film basically like is the, the, the way the destruction's done like those those towers and stuff they wobble and then like little sections come out and stuff and they fall down and it's like it looks a little dumb but I like I, I really liked it I, I thought it looked great I especially like the shots of they, they put you at a POV shot of somebody up in a building, and you got the destruction behind them going on, and they're in the building, the building's falling down and shit, stuff's falling on them, and all of a sudden they drop out of frame because, oh, the building just dropped. You know, like, right, that right. stuff looked really great. Yeah, no, Very, there's, great. there's some really effective stuff here, and even some of the kind of, like, big city model shots, while they don't mm-hmm. look realistic, you know, they look good. I mean, it looks mm-hmm. something like something. I mean, it is, again, I say this fairly regularly, like, this would have been really effective on the big screen, I think. You know, kind of. Yeah. Time. But even now, I think if you saw it and kind of projected, you would get a lot of like it would it would really kind of imprint on you in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. I think. It, it, um, it, it looks no worse than like uh, the the cheapest sort of like Toho Studios Godzilla stuff or whatever. You know, like it, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much on par. Like it, it's just they didn't have the money. They didn't have like the fancy camera equipment and stuff. Like the, the you know the Japanese had the benefit of like. 20 years of technology yeah. and stuff. Well, and this they, is, uh, again, the very beginning of it, and it is, mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of amazing how well it holds up knowing that, you know, nobody had really done a lot of this before, you know. Mm-hmm. There had been sort of model shots, but not not on this scale and not kind of doing it in this, and not kind of doing this, like, big swath of destruction kind of stuff. I, re- I also really like, even though, like, it, it sort of front loads all the, like, cool stuff in this film in the first 20 minutes, I like how they do it. I, I like that, you know, it starts out with this sort of, like, stock footage foo kind of stuff where it's like, you know, disaster happening, barometers going down, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then you see, like, you know, uh, fucking airplanes flying and stock footage of ships and stuff. like All ships, come back into port. And you see all this stock footage of ships. Look at all our stock footage, you know. And it, it's back in the day where, you know, the footage they're actually shooting doesn't look any better or worse than the stock footage, so it all blends very well. So I like that. And then it's very effective in the, in the way that it essentially cuts about 20 minutes of bullshit. You don't need out of this film. Like it just stuck it, the, the, the opening, like 20 minutes of this, uh, or well, the opening, like 10 minutes of this before they get to the 10 minutes of destruction. It's just a big montage and they insert briefly. Oh yeah. Here's uh here's our professional swimmer character. Who's going to be the love interest. Here's our family. 
you, you see them briefly. You see a really bad effect shot of uh, the family who live in this like country house, even though they look like they're rich, upper class people. There, there's this really bad shot of a tree hitting their house. The, the tree doesn't even like sort of lean over and then fall into the house. It just goes like that real quick, which is like, okay, uh, you, you could have, you know, uh, overcranked that a little bit maybe but the, the way they get you to the disaster stuff really quick they don't bore you with a bunch of details about plot and all that shit it's just like disasters are coming and here's the disaster and that's really cool then they bore you with the next 40 minutes of what the fuck is this shit <laughs> <laughs> right well and i feel like the uh I, I feel like a lot of like the reason a lot of films were short around this time was that they would show them as double bills mm-hmm. and so you got to an evening at the movies and so you'd see sort of an a picture and a b picture and this would be sort of like right you'd see you know oh like big sumptuous romantic drama or whatever and then like cut to you know brief intermission go get some more popcorn and then come back and like city destroyed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I think this is like a, you know, like a Skid Row kind of picture. It was, yeah. you know, a very, very cheap seat kind of movie. We'll get in, you know, into the money details, but it, it, it did like apparently moderately well for RKO yeah, at, the yeah. t- at the time. But, made a little money. That's fine. Yeah. Um, what I found interesting just in, just, I mean, you know, we could keep talking about the effects forever, although I think we should kind of move on from uh, mm-hmm. and talk about some of the rest of the film. But um, what... Uh, I found interesting about sort of like production design is that like you, you, you talk to people who do this kind of work for on any kind of scale on, on music videos on the, you know, like people who are making music videos for a few thousand dollars. I mean, this is something that like you, you see um, you know, even today, I mean, music videos are basically made on like a shoestring budget by like, you know, like entrepreneurs who are just kind of going out there and doing and bidding like the lowest possible bid. And so they kind of do everything themselves. And what they'll tell you is that, you know, production design is really about time. It's really, it's, mm-hmm. it's not really, you know, it, it's, re- it's not really about like what tools you have because kind of everybody has the same tools, you know, at, like at that level, as much as it is, it's about like how much time you can really kind of put into it. And right. like, when you look at these kind of like exquisite models, it is like, yeah, the models just look really good. And if the they models do. look really good, then you're going to get a good looking scene kind of regardless of, you know, your kind of other technical limitations that are kind of built around it. And, and I think that that's sort of like, even in terms of like, you know, scenes and, you know, why do so many like sitcoms look really cheap? Well, it's because like all the walls are like decorated with like, like one photo in a, in a corner or whatever. Like, mm. it doesn't look real. It looks like this kind of like super cheap set because not because it's even cheap, but because they didn't put any time into like actually developing it. So yeah. Again, one of the ways you make a cheap movie look good is you just put time into, like, you know, designing every frame. Um, and I think that that's kind of one of the lessons we can take from a movie like this. Um, moving on into uh, some of the other um, elements, I mean, again, that kind of second part, this sort of, like, you know, the swimmer runs into these two dudes. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, you kind of think, man, one of these is guys, like, it feels a little bit like a Fargo, like Peter Stormare and, like, the <laughs> story situation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like this woman she's gonna end up she's they're gonna eat her <laughs> you yeah. know like you know the, there is this there is this kind of sense of like man there's something really dark happening in the in the center of this movie i don't know i don't know like uh i really liked the uh the look of uh what's his name jepson um, yeah fred kohler yeah fred kohler um with the i think he's the one with the like the big hair and yep. the bushy red beard um i really like you don't see a lot of guys in movies that look like that around this time. I mean, you see very, you don't see that many of them now, but it's certainly around this time. You know, you kind of get these kind of generic square jawed heroes or whatever. Yeah. And here you actually get somebody who look, you get a couple of guys who look like people. And I think they're supposed to be sort of like, you know, deliverance country or whatever. And I think that's why they're allowed to look like people. But uh, yeah, like, and then you think like, oh, this, this is a horror movie all of a sudden. Like we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're in the middle of a horror movie. And I don't know. what do you, what do you think of that little, you know, 20 minute bit? No, it's, I kind of wish that the whole film was kind of like, you know, the the whole last half of the film was just about this. Honestly, mm-hmm. like, it, it's a it's a really it's a really good tension piece. Although, you know, basically the other guy isn't sympathetic at all because he's the first one to try to rape her. <laughs> right. It's like it's like okay, the the, yeah, the Steve Buscemi tries to rape her basically, <laughs> but <laughs> a little of the old in and out. But no, they, I'm, just, I'm they, just doing bits from Fargo now. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but they, 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 yeah, he was kind of funny looking. 
<laughs> what in a general sense or not just funny looking you know like uh yeah no uh but this film really goes south really fast and i don't mean it in a bad way i just mean like it it takes it takes a thematic turn that you were not expecting at all yeah. we have you know we have these two goons who find her washed up on the beach she survives because she's a great swimmer and so that's that's the only reason so she, she survives. Can swim to mississippi that's what happens she leaves mm-hmm. new york Swims all the way to Mississippi, and that's that's where she that's where she does it twice. She swims a big distance, and she swims another big distance, and washes up on the shore. Yeah. She's got a bad habit of doing that. I imagine but, in another world, another universe, there was like a series of sequels. Because at the end of this movie, she just goes and swims off, and mm-hmm. like, she just keeps swimming into different movies. <laughs> yeah, she looks, like, she looks for anthology the movies. She looks for the the utopian post apocalyptic society that she can finally yeah, yeah. fit into because she gets away from these two fucking goons. One of them gets killed. You know, Kohler kills the the Steve Buscemi guy, strangles him to death because he's trying to muscle in on my woman. Okay. Like, there's even a conversation. It's like I found this cabin. <laughs> I saw I own it. it. I found the cabin first. I own it. God damn you! <laughs> yeah, and I found her first. I own her. You fuck off. And he's like, I'm going to go out and try to fix the boat so we can do some fishing and shit. And uh, you come with me here, you know, come. And he's like, he thinks about it. It's like, no, I'd rather go over there and like try to come in her. And that doesn't work out for him too well. He gets bashed with a pan on the head. Then he gets strangled by Fred Kohler, who comes back in like, what the fuck's going on? She runs away. She she strips down again. Thank you, movie. Jumps in the water. Quite as long of a shot at that point. But, you know, you get a little bit. You get a little Mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Then she swims into this other society, a little ways down the down the uh, coastline, I guess, <laughs> where women are given no agency at all. <laughs> they are now commodities and they are either give they're they're given these options. You take a husband, you're given a husband, or you're just fucking raped and you like it, basically is, is what it is. And that's supposed to be the ideal society. Right. That's this, the this good is, society the, in this This film. is the great this is you know what we need is a nice dose of patriarchy. You know, mm. just a nice dose of like completely authoritarian patriarchy. You do get another woman living in the society and even children running around. Mm-hmm. So clearly this is where this is the this is the actual healthy society that is reproducing itself. This is where you'd actually want to live. Um, you know, yeah, but around. but but you uh, know she she meets up with our our hero from the beginning there, who is probably the only like thing close to a decent guy in this film. Who, right. You know who who lost his family. She feels sorry for him. They fall in love. Yada yada. And then we discover not only that his wife and children are actually alive. Uh, we also get the conflict of Fred Kohler, like, gets this big gang of fucking thugs, like, I found a woman, you want to come with me, and I'll give you all dibs on her, we can all fuck her, basically, <laughs> I think is, like, the deal there, right. and, and so they're, they're like, yeah, we want to fuck a woman, and so they all bring their guns, and they go looking for our hero, and then we have the town of Misogynyville, or whatever, who are technically the good guys in this film. Right. <laughs> they uh they help them out like they save their bacon basically but yeah no no yeah it's uh this film goes places <laughs> it definitely goes places it definitely goes places um what i found uh interesting is that you get the uh the guy's wife shows back up at the end mm-hmm. and then suddenly there's this there's this tension because like there's this kind of love it's not even like a love triangle it's kind of this like yeah. love you know, V almost where, you know, the guy is kind of torn between the two women who both, you know, he has a legitimate like decision to make and like, mm-hmm. they never really make a decision, you know, no. it's kind of just like, you know, she makes a decision. She's like, well, she this. makes a decision of like, well, you know, if you're not gonna, I mean, if it's going to be a bother, I guess I'll just go swim to the next terrible society where people are going to try to rape me. That's, yeah. that's clearly the next choice in my life. Well, in, in the original book too, it's the women who make the decision. It's like no. the, the the original wife sort of gives her the original wife comes back and it's like, well, if you're in love with my husband now. I I can't intrude on that. I'm just take my kids and leave. And then it's the the new woman who's well, no, fuck, come, let let's you know, let's come together. And so in a way, uh, the original story is the good version of the world, the flesh, <laughs> and the devil. Well, not not the good version, but the better ending, the world, the right, flesh, right, and the devil. Yeah, yeah. And and this movie sort of could have gone there and touched on that, but it doesn't, so it's like, okay. Uh, 
I don't know. Maybe certain things were like too far, even for the pre-code era. Like they really just weren't willing to go there. I think there might have been some of that. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you where they were willing to go. I'll tell you where they're fucking willing to go. You, the auction at the end of the film. Yeah. Where you know they're they're auctioning off like you know the what's it like a Venus de Milo or the fuck statue, yeah. and there's a black guy in the in the <sighs> auction who goes. <laughs> well, I'll give you two bits for that there uh, statue because well, the arms are broken off. Yes, you got the, his arms are broken. It's like, Jesus Christ, you got like one black guy in your movie. And of course, this is, it's like, I don't even want to give it the credit for it's 1933. It's just like, wow, that was racist even then. So, like that's... And, and then it goes creepy because an old guy buys the statue and right. implies he's going to jerk off to it later. Uh, I'll take that for a dollar. Yep, you guys yes. got no imagination. <laughs> yeah, no. There's some. There, there's some. There's some. There's some stuff in this for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to rate something like this because it's both sort of like there's a lot of great stuff here, and I think it's interesting. I think people should watch it, mm-hmm. and I, th- I think there is enjoyable stuff, but it is kind of difficult to kind of like. I think it, do you I think like it this movie? I, I like it. I like it. I think it kind of works. Like, there's nothing. Like, like I mean, the 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 politics and the social stuff is all actively yeah. bad when you actually reflect on it. But I mean, for the time, I just hate using that kind of excuse for it. But I mean, for the time, it kind of works in general. As like, you well, know, and you can view it kind of as like a commentary. Like, it, you can view it as a viewer. You kind of take it as like. She wanders into the society, and that's just kind of the nature of the society. We don't have to we don't have to judge it as like this is what the movie is saying is yeah. like ideal. So much as like this is just the situation that we find ourselves in, you know. Yeah, uh, but the fact that like there's one black guy, and he's like, you know, that statue's broken. We clearly can't. I, I'm not paying for a full price for that. It's like, oh man, that. Yeah, and you know, all the white people laugh at him. Like, look at that funny yeah. Negro. But you know, he, if you ever stepped out of line, you know he was going to get lynched, right? I mean, oh, that's yeah, yeah. exactly well, there, what was going to happen. One black guy, he's like the. And then again, there's a way of like resolving that and being like, yeah, he's just putting that on <laughs> so that like they don't lynch him. Yeah, like, <laughs> um, it turns out that he's like this very like well lettered like Shakespearean actor or whatever. <laughs> and then like in the next scene, you know, our our, our heroine, you know, like runs into him and suddenly she, he like gives her food and it's like reading Shakespeare and it's like oh well, no actually madame I am you know this very well lettered person I just have to play this role and then it turns out that that's the real like loving relationship that she needed to be in all along because you respect her like you know natural human rights and uh... <laughs> yeah then you get then you get Harry Belafonte for World yeah. Flesh and the Devil right yeah, yeah no, that's, it. Yeah. that's it. this would make a nice little uh, nice little companion piece it would it, it really devil. would yeah I think the first 20 minutes would work as a really great short film. Like it's a, like a highlight reel kind of disaster piece thing. And I mean, honestly, um, you know, part of the trivia here, <laughs> that footage was bought up. Oh yeah. But, yeah. Like other studios, they didn't want to buy the whole film. They just wanted to buy the disaster footage and, and reuse that. Right. So, I mean, there, <laughs> there is some value. Russ Meyer bought a very particular, like six seconds of this movie for his <laughs> private <laughs> For his private, uh, you know, viewing, but uh, other than that, yeah, it was pretty much just a disaster. Yeah, I, th- I think it's you know, it's not. It wouldn't be a contender for my best of the year. No, uh, definitely no. not. But I think even as clunky as like the transition from the disaster to the sort of melodrama conflict thing is, it works fine. And and I mean, it, yeah. it's it's a bit of an anomaly for its time. You you were saying this is probably the first time any audience ever saw a disaster film, really, unless you know this is playing at the same time as King Kong, and you know they they, you know maybe this is on one side of the street and King Kong's on the other, or maybe even double bill. Who knows? I didn't like look into it, but you know, imagine seeing this and then go and seeing King Kong. That'd be something back in the day. (laughs) That would be. That would be, you'd be like, you know, this is the future of cinema, mm-hmm. stop motion special effects. <laughs> if, if, you, if you were to ask me what I prefer uh, to even today, I'd be like, give me the stop motion, honestly. So, and I'm not even saying that to be like an anti CGI snob, but I'd rather have practical effects. And I mean, there's no reason why 
stop motion can't be done other than cost and time. Like that's the big factor right. now, right? Like, well, and even I- even like even CGI, like CGI is like super time intensive. Mm-hmm. It's just that, like you can just hire, you know, like a whole lot of people with computers. And with CGI, the, the big benefit is you can correct the errors right away. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with stop motion, if you're Ray Harryhausen and you do like eight thousand sh- photographs to uh, get an arm on a Medusa to to move and you get one of them wrong, you got to go back in the sequence and redo it. It's like, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. And King Kong was actually released first. It was released in uh, March, April, whereas uh, um, Deluge was released in August. So, you know, oh, okay. King, Kong, King Kong was a few months before this and, uh, you know, cost six times as much for that. Yeah. Matter, so, you know. But yeah, no, this is, this is a perfectly good B picture. And I mean, you, you can't, I, I don't think you can, um, overstate the influence of it like i mean yeah. honestly i see so many i've seen so many movies whether they're you know big budget ones today or just shitty little b movies that do this sort of thing they're all kind of spawned from this idea i mean they, they all use the same yeah. techniques they got the miniatures they've got the composite shots you know, I, I enjoy this. I think you know, I'd I'd watch it again. I think I think it's worth a rewatch. I think I might enjoy some of the melodrama stuff a little bit more than you do. I think there is some some interesting stuff there. It did remind me of some of the kind of low budget westerns that mm-hmm. we watched um, a couple of years ago. Uh, what's the, you know, um, uh, I forget the title of the thing, but you know, there there's some there's some stuff that does kind of strike me as just kind of it is kind of trying to do that same sort of thing. And I feel like this is sort of, you know, kind of doing that kind of prototypical, like we're kind of doing a little bit of like the sci-fi post-apocalyptic Western thing, except we're not really kind of well, doing it in a, you know, a, a lot um, of uh, a lot of like the 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 post-apocalyptic like nuclear bomb movies. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is the DNA of that. Like they do the exact same thing. You got the nuclear bomb, and then like, but although basically the whole movie is people fighting over women or whatever the fuck, right? right, right kind right. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, overall, I think it's interesting. I think it's it's definitely again, it's worth an hour and six minutes of your time, or you know, however long your your cut lasts. Mm-hmm. Um, the Kino Larber uh, print looks really nice, and um, yeah, it's enjoyable. It's not on our top ten list, and again, part of that part of that is it's you know, it's kind of we've seen this before, and part of it is uh, we're you know, we're watching a lot of the greatest movies ever made this year. Yeah, so, you know, um, it just doesn't like it's clearly not on that not on that caliber, but um, it is it is worth a watch and. Uh, I think um, people should uh, see it more and talk about it more. I, I totally agree. I, I would I would recommend people see it, even just you know if if you're a film nerd and you kind of want to like research where certain certain tropes and things come from. Like, there's a lot of stuff here that uh, you see in movies even to this day that really owes a debt to this kind of stuff. So uh, so do it. Budget for this was a hundred and seventy one thousand or so uh, estimated. Uh, apparently it went way over budget. So uh, although it was a mild success from what I could gather from different sources, they made about a quarter of a million dollars in returns and it probably didn't make any money actually. Uh, when, at, all said and done for advertising and uh, all that other shit. But um, for a number of years, this was a lost film. <laughs> Yet another lost film that we run into. Uh, there was a dubbed Italian release that was discovered by Force J. Ackerman, of all fucking people, uh, Uncle Forey. Uh, I can't imagine why he would have a copy of this sitting in his vault. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, he just he discovered the Italian uh, dubbed print, apparently, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and Forrest Ackerman... Uh, founder of uh, Famous Monsters uh, magazine and uh, general one of the original fucking horror movie nerds, sci-fi nerds and he... No, I, so, meant the, I meant that didn't he have only original like King Kong for a number of years? I think he did, yeah like like he was, yeah. he was a collector he, he was a... Pre- yeah, he was he, a big he, time he was, collector Yeah, he was yeah. into preserving all this stuff right, so... He, I was being he, sarcastic no, it makes perfect uh, sense that this would be in his collection yeah, Yeah, but no, he hunted it down He had, he had like one of the original like buildings like sitting in the back <laughs> <laughs> had his water stains on it or whatever. He yeah. he had the original bikini. Uh, he sold it to Russ Meyer in 1961. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he hunted this down, found it in 1981. So that was released with you know uh, English uh, subtitles, and it was it was a very poor quality. But in 2016, a complete duplicate and uh, English dubbing was was discovered. 
uh, in the French National Archive. And so they went with that. And that's the Kino Lorber print you mm-hmm. see now, which looks fucking great. Like, it, it looks pretty exquisite. Like I said, the composite shots, they look like dog shit, but that's actually on the filmmaking more than it no, is trying to clean the not, it's, not because the, it's not because the negative looks like crap or anything. It's, it mm-hmm. looks like crap because... It accurately captured the way it looked in nineteen thirty three. and as I said, the uh early special effects uh portions of the film appeared frequently in subsequent Republic serials and features, which uh, they bought them for. So uh you can see uh a lot of this footage in SOS Title Wave from nineteen thirty nine, Dick Tracy versus Crime Incorporated in nineteen forty one, oh. uh King of the Rocket Men from nineteen forty nine and the Martians and Us 2006 TV series, apparently, which yeah. I don't know the fuck that is, but uh, I kind of want to check it out just to see what the hell yeah, that's about. <laughs> uh, it could be like they just like put it on a TV in the background or something. Like, yeah. You know? <laughs> like, you know, oh, Night of the Living Dead shows up on the TV in this horror movie from the 80s. Yeah, no kidding. Because, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. a scene in Deluge that features a wave that uh, leaves New York submerged in water and nearly all inhabitants of the city drown would later be recreated in the 2004 disaster film, The Day After Tomorrow. And yeah, that's a, like there's a direct recreation of that film. Yeah. Of this. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, so next time, we're going to have some very special guests from the Grind Bin podcast. And uh, we're going to be doing The Testament of Dr. Mabusa. That's a big film. We're going to have a lot of shit to say about that one. Uh, we're going to have you know, two guests. Probably going to be a long episode, I admit. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, until we'll then. More to it. Mm-hmm. And then it's one I've wanted to do for a long time. So uh, it's good stuff. So uh, until then, uh, Daniel, uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Daniel Lee Harper. That's usually the best way to get in touch with me. I also do a podcast about uh, far right dipshits called I Don't Speak German. You find that at I Don't Speak German. Yeah. And uh, you can find more of this on uh, tmbdos.podbean.com, where you can find our Facebook, YouTube, uh, and Apple Podcast links. And, of course, you can find all of our other little podcasts that we've been uh, sort of doing uh, underneath the uh, TMB DOS uh, sort of umbrella. Uh, We just recorded a cape shit tonight uh, for Avengers Age of Ultron, so you'll see that very soon. All the uh, weird radio shows that I do. <laughs> the blood, the blood on the tracks, and uh, got a got a show with uh, Lee Van Teeth, the Wolfman, uh, coming very soon. Probably by September, the first episode of that's going to show up, and uh, that should be fun. And uh, yeah, until then, uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, we'll see you guys again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Cheers. Baby, I'm yours. Baby, I'm yours. And I'll be yours. Yours until the stars fall from the sky. Yours. Yours until the rivers all run dry. In other words, until I die. Baby. Baby, I'm yours.
Thank you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Site. For further episodes, our Apple Podcasts, Facebook, and YouTube links, please go to tmbdos.podbean.com. Thank you. Drive through.